Thank you, Marnie. And thanks everyone for taking the time to practice together. To me, that's already such an act of generosity. Just by being here. It would be very weird if I would be sitting here by myself or with Marnie in this Harlem bedroom. It's like you make it happen just by being here. So I want to thank you, Marnie, and Sangha Lai for making these sessions possible and for inviting me. And uh, as Marnie was saying, we'll start with the guided meditation. And I was thinking about um, a meditation that I've really been exploring a lot recently myself. And it uses imagery. And it has its roots in Tibetan practice. And I find it really helpful to bring imagery to my experience sometimes. And so this is very simple. In the guided practice, you're invited to just feel the body body like mountain. I love that image of just being able to sit on the earth, still, upright, just like a mountain. Another image I'd love to use in a guided practice is breath like wind. This is wind is like constantly flowing through us. Breath like wind. It takes that sense of my breath right out of it. And the last image I'd like to use in the guided practice is mind like sky. And uh, today I was listening to a talk by Andrew Olensky, a Buddhist scholar, teacher, author. He was teaching at our online sangha called the Community Meditation Center. He also added this one line, mind like water. Especially when water is still when it's not touched by wind or it's not boiling, then we can see our own reflection. And so in the guided practice, I hope to invite you to really kind of calm the whole system. But I'm also going to ask you in the guided practice to reflect from time to time, is there any wanting in my mind? Any craving? And maybe you sometimes notice it and go, oh, it's here. Maybe you might also notice, hey, this is a moment I'm not wanting anything. I'm just okay with the way things are. This particular invitation to practice in this way comes from the Buddha as he was teaching ways to befriend craving. And that is really our topic for today. How can we find a, a space and a way to actually befriend one of the most powerful tendency in our minds, craving. And that will be our topic for today. And so I'm gonna invite you to maybe just shake your body a little. Maybe get up, maybe move a little bit, maybe shake your hands. If you're on mute, you could even maybe kind of vibrate your vocal cords and uh, whatever you feel like wanna do. Maybe you've been idle for on this Sunday and you kind of want to move a little. Take your time. You're on a little mini retreat. Stretch. Maybe decide video on or off. And then see if you could situate the body like, like a mountain. Maybe that mountain wants to lay down, wants to stand, but wants to sit upright. Body like mountain.
Am I aware? Letting awareness know what it's like to have a body right now. And check if it needs adjusting, a lowering of your shoulders, a softening of the belly. These body sensations of touch, temperature, the body exists. body like mountain. Is there any wanting for the body to be in a certain way? More comfort, less pain, more ease. Is wanting or craving energy present or absent? Awareness will tell you. The body is breathing.
breath like wind. Letting there be in the breathing, simply the breathing. Is there any wanting for the breathing to be in a certain way? Maybe deeper, longer, less shallow. Or is this wanting absent? Just checking for a moment. Breath like wind. Body like mountain, breath like wind, mind like sky. How is it to have a human mind in this moment? Its nature is to think, images, word thoughts, emotions. If 
well, these visitors of the mind. Maybe it's tired or restless. Calm, concentrated. Is there any craving for the mind to be in a certain way? Less sleepy, more peaceful. Is there any wanting? Or is it absent just in this moment? See what it's like to be aware. Does it feel continuous or interrupted? Knowing you can come home to Dubai and its sensations, body like mountain. Or coming home to the breathing Breath like wind. You feel more stable. So connecting the states of mind coming and going. Mind like sky.
there any wanting present or absent in this moment? Just to explore for a moment and letting the question drop. See what happens when you know. Body like mountain, and breath like wind, mind like sky. Thank you for your practice. I'd love to um, share a reflection with you on craving. Before doing so, um, Barney has also asked me to share some personal reflections on a practice of Donna that she uh, shared a little bit about in the beginning of our session. And dana is a Pali word that was the language in which the teachings were recorded. And most of the times it's translated as giving or sharing. And uh, I live with a particular um, lifestyle of only sharing teacher teachings without any set price, freely offered. It, and uh, it was very scary at the beginning. I started like four years ago, and it wasn't like I made this conscious decision. Now I don't teach anymore for set prizes because I used to do that a lot in New York City schools and in detention centers. But because of COVID, a lot of these things ended in my in, in, for me, and it's very special when uh, you're supported by people who share the same aspiration to wake up and to practice and 
befriend your own mind. But it's also scary. And I remember once telling my teacher that I was a little afraid of this lifestyle. He'd been living this lifestyle for many years. And he has this very comforting voice. His name is Joseph, Joseph Goldstein. And he, he just told me, I truly trust that when you take good care of the Dharma, it will take good care of you. And every time when there's a little doubt coming in, you know, when bills need to be paid here, I'll just pause. And most of the times, Joseph's voice comes to mind. If you take good care of the Dharma, it will take good care of you. And it has been so far, and I'm appreciative of that. And the Buddha also said that use your generosity to calm the mind. He, for example, said, in a moment when you are recollecting generous deeds that you've done, in that moment, your mind won't be overcome with craving. Your mind won't be overcome by greed. It won't be overcome by desire. It will calm down. It will actually feel joy. And so at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll offer ways that the Buddha suggested how to let go of craving. One is already to recollect all the sharing and giving that you do. Let's bring in the Buddha's words. He said this, and it's in a description of today's teaching. And what is the cause by which stress comes into play? Which is already a cool question. What is the cause by which stress comes into play? If you would ask people in the streets here in New York, I, I wonder if they would give this answer. Craving is the cause by which stress comes into play. I mean, just think of that myriad of all these difficult mind states and difficult situations that we find ourselves in in the world, the Buddha boiled it down to wanting. And just pause for a moment to see how you respond to this bold statement. Craving is the cause by which stress comes into play. Do you agree? I still sometimes feel that sense of, really? Is that really what it boils down to? Especially when I'm in the thick of it. So let's unpack that a little more. And first thing I want to do is share some words and um, some definitions so that we're on the same page about what the Buddha meant. And in this language, in the Pali language, the term that he used the most was tanha, T-A-N-H-A. And the literal translation is being thirsty or hungry. You know that visceral bodily impact when you really feel like you want to eat something or you're very thirsty. What happens when you have that experience? And we might be privileged that we've never really experienced it in the extreme ways. But what happens when you're really thirsty or hungry? My mind gets fixated gets obsessed. It wants it to happen. But this is just already one way that the Buddha described this tendency that really is the root cause of our suffering. Feeling thirsty, obsessed with hunger or thirst. And the uh, some of you have heard me share this story a million times. I'm sorry for repeating, but it's my favorite. In the high school I used to teach, there were um, kids whom I saw often. And they talked a lot about addiction. They said, 
does the mindfulness also help with addiction? I said, what kind of addiction? I said, our phones. And I didn't really know how to answer that. And But I thought of the instruction that the Buddha said, the first thing you do is check if it's present or absent. So I had this idea of inviting everyone to bring their phone to the classroom, put them on a yoga mat, and just have everyone sit around in a circle and just observe what's going on. I had to ask everyone to put it on vibrate and volume on. So we just sat, 30 of us around a pile of phones, and we just observed our minds and noticed this craving, absent, or present. And even me, I felt when I heard this, mm -mm, mm -mm, I felt my body moving forward. It was just this, it's just, oh, this is what it feels like in the body, leaning forward, huh, wanting. More sounds went on. And it became clear that I wasn't the only one. Around me, there were kids who also were their eyes open and also moving forward. And, and one young girl, Stephanie, she just really showed craving in the most beautiful way ever. Because she started looking around. She got very restless. Started moving her hands a little bit. And all of a sudden, she just stood up, walked to the pile. Even I hadn't rung the bell yet picked up her phone, looked at it, and I was extremely disappointed when she goes, this is not my, this, this wasn't for me. I thought it was for me. And everyone laughed, but everyone also started to appreciate what she'd done. She's shown us what craving can physically look like. Another word that might resonate more for you than craving in English is desire. This is from the dictionary. A strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. In meditation, it could feel like, I want more focus. I want that bell to ring. I want more insights. Am I doing it wrong? So just pause again, just wherever you are, maybe move your body a little bit and investigate again. This craving or desire, is it present or absent right now? Is the body maybe leaning forward? And if you settle back, you'll notice the difference. Maybe there are planning thoughts. After the Sangha live session, I'm going to go outside and cycle to my indoor swimming pool, whatever. Is there any wanting right now? Also check if you might experience the absence of it. This kind of like feverish leaning forward, this restless energy might be absent. So in befriending craving, it's just as much important to be aware of when it's there than when it's not there. Because something really special happens when we are not craving, 
and for a few moments free of desire. And the Buddha often used the metaphor of water. When our mind is not hindered by wanting, it's like water that's not touched. Like a swimming pool where a lot of kids can be really wild and the water is wild and then they all come out. After 30 seconds, that swimming pool is completely still and you can see your reflection. It's what the mind can feel like when it's free from craving. Mind like sky. Buddha also said, and this is an interesting reflection, he said, when your mind is not hindered by craving, but also aversion or fear or doubt, it becomes easy to see the good in other people and to see the good in yourself. And of course, also the opposite. When that energy of pursuing desire is strong, it's hard to see the good in oneself and in others. It narrows our perspective. And I think in its most gross forms, craving can manifest as addiction. And then I was thinking about what's another word just to get like, again, a feel for it besides craving and desire. And then the word greed came to mind. And um, I had to think of this children's book that I used to read many, many times to our son, Lou. It's called The Very Hungry Caterpillar. It's probably translated in your language too. I forgot, I forget the author. And in that book, The Caterpillar, all of a sudden goes on this eating spree and he eats bacon and a lollipop and a, uh, an ochre, what's that in English? A pickle. <laughs> and the very hungry caterpillar, but the Dutch translation I think is better. Uh, little caterpillar, never enough. Never enough. That's what Tana can also feel like. The sense of never enoughness. So I looked up the word greed in the dictionary too, and it says excessive consumption or excessive desire for food, wealth, or power. Let's see how that resonates. When that pursuing of desire is like in a more gross form. Is it present? Is it absent? And this powerful energy of greed, I see it a lot also around me here in New York. Just the ads, all the advertisements on buses, on the streets and subways. They tell me what I need. I need less acne. I see advertisements that I need more hair. And the one that I see a lot specifically in America is when I have pain, I need a lawyer. And it feels like just a simple absence of craving, contentment, is like the worst enemy of capitalism. And I, I fall for it too. I don't know if you have that experience too, but I sometimes start to believe I need this. But it's just wanting. I don't really need it. And just a few weeks ago, I was almost trapped. I was going through my Instagram feed and all of a sudden, I see this advertisement for, no, it was like this. You, you have been chosen to earn a, to get a free guitar. And I was looking for guitars. I, I want a new electric guitar. And just fill out all your information, click here, and we'll send you a free Gibson guitar. But you only have five minutes. And the, the time started ticking down. So I go, okay. My wife and my Lou was also, they were in the house. 
And then I start feeling more anxious because email, my address, and even I start to kind of like, is this, is this good? <laughs> so I go, can you help me here? I can win a free guitar. And they all go, show us, show us. And they're like, no, Bart, that's a scam. Don't do that. It doesn't sound right. And I end up not doing it. And then it went to zero. And I did feel that sense of, oh, I missed it. I missed it. Then I looked up online and it does, it, it is a scam. But the greed narrowed my view. And I became obsessed with wanting a Gibson guitar. The Buddha had a very beautiful metaphor. He says, if you ever have a bowl of water, again, when the water is not touched by anything, you can see your reflection. Just like when your mind is for a few moments free of wanting and aversion, it becomes clear. Someone is saying, don't click the link <laughs> in the chat. But when your mind is clear, the Buddha said, it's like a bowl of water. You can see a reflection in it. When there's wanting, the water has all these dyes in it. It's beautiful. So you kind of get lost in looking at the beauty of what's going on in that bowl, but you can't see your own reflection. That's how craving can feel like. <laughs> we get lost in looking at the beauty. But that's not enough. That's the first, ex the first thing uh, the Buddha suggested. When you're noticing craving or any other difficult mind state, check, be aware, but also notice its absence. He had another pair of suggestions. And now he wants us to actively engage with the experience. In other words, the Buddha wants to ask us, what feeds craving? What else is there? And also what feeds the letting go when you're, when there's no craving, what else is there? So you become aware of what actually is conditioning. it. And the Buddha had an answer when he was asked, you know, what is the food for craving? And his answer is a little cryptic, so bear with me. He said, there's the sign of the beautiful. There is the sign of the beautiful which is the nutriment for craving to arise. But he went on, the sign of the beautiful, frequently giving careless attention to it, is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen desire and for the increase and in expansion of already arisen desire. So this is like, the Buddha's answer, what feeds craving? Beautiful things when we give it frequent, careless attention. Just check if that resonates for you, that answer. So this, this restless seeking for pleasure, of attractive, beautiful things or experiences. I mean, I'll share my mind is really good at looking for pleasure, comfort, happiness. And also I want to share that this is natural. We all do it. The Buddha is saying it can also be very stressful. It's like that hungry caterpillar. What can I eat next? What can I see next? What can I hear next? What can I think next? Constantly planning for the next experience of the beautiful. And I'd love to, when in just a few moments, invite you too to share in the, with the community what feeds your craving. 
because I noticed a few weeks ago I was teaching a retreat and it was an in-person retreat and at the end of it in one afternoon I had some downtime and I was just really noticing how tired I was and I could just go my mind think if only I were home now I would be more happy. I would only get over this hump, holding more space for a large group of people. Happiness will be on the other side. It's often that we kind of believe the thing that we are trying to pursue that's going to give us pleasure next. So we've really been reflecting on what the Buddha called the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, of stress. But he also talked a lot about the first noble truth, that there is suffering in life, pain and sorrow. The Buddha was readily to admit it, that that's part of being human, being alive. But this teaching about craving points to that the pain in our lives is not really what causes all the misery. This is a really important point. The pain in our lives is not what really causes all the misery in our lives. And this is from Pema Children. She said, what causes misery is always trying to get away from the facts of life. Always trying to avoid pain and seek happiness. It's this sense of ours that there could be lasting security and happiness available to us if we could only do the right thing. If only I had this. This is such an important habitual thought to catch in your practice. It's what drives so much stress. If only I had this. And it's so human and it keeps our economy running. So it's a really helpful reflection that I'd love to encourage you to, to try on. What feeds these tendencies to want, to crave, to desire for you? What beautiful signs to speak the Buddha's language or experience do you often crave and give careless attention to? You just often do, but you're not really mindful. And I'll be, I'll stand on the concession stand with you. For me, it's the phone, just like Stephanie in that um, high school. I... I might want to look up something on the phone, <laughs> like a quote of the Buddha that happened to me a few weeks ago. But then I see a number two next to my, you know, mail icon. I'll just click my email. I read the email. Then all of a sudden, I'm on a Dutch news feed. And it talks about some flooding somewhere, recently, I think somewhere in Dubai. And then I was like, let me just Google Dubai and the airport of Dubai, and all of a sudden I'm in Dubai, and I just wanted to look up a quote of the Buddha on craving. Oh, uh oh, it's humbling, isn't it? It happens a lot, but also its absence happens a lot. Oh. But it's the care, it's the frequent Careless attention, that's really important. So another one, another nutriment for craving for me is unpleasant and painful experiences. Just to want to avoid pain and just start finding pleasure. Again, so natural and human. You know, just like when I was on that retreat and I was just picturing and daydreaming about being home and having some downtime. And I notice it a lot in my meditation. 
especially when it comes to difficult mind states like fear. In my early days, I was thinking, oh, this is worry. Oh yeah, mindfulness, worry. Worry of fears like this. And then there was this disappointment that I was aware of. And when I unpack that also with my teacher a little more, I'm so disappointed. I've been disappointed in the practice, in myself. And then he asked why. I said, because mindfulness is not really making the fear go away. It doesn't. Very often we can have what I call the hidden agenda of craving in our mindfulness, the way we hold mindfulness. And that's how a lot of people start, like thinking, oh, if I'm mindful of it, stress reduction. And that's not how it works. Mindfulness simply knows the experience. It's not immediately making it, dis it disappear. It's way more helpful than to turn your attention to is craving the pursuing of desire present or absent. And now I have this rule in my meditation that every time when I feel some tension, I know craving is there too. I just have to find it. Every time your mind is Intention, there's tension in the mind, there's also craving. Likewise with fear. When there's fear, when you are fearful, there's craving. It's really helpful to sometimes in your meditation check, how is how am I relating to this experience? Because maybe then you notice that you're having a craving attitude. And Leslie in the chat is sharing. And my trigger is the idea that I have to like everything. I have lost my sense of taste. So I never like the taste of anything. But I still want to eat. So when that have to energy is, is there, craving is there. But awareness does have a purifying experience. And this is really important because the more and more we keep seeing and feeling and knowing the feverish pursuing of desire, wisdom eventually will come on, come in and doesn't want to keep pursuing it. It's like in meditation practice then, you know, I might feel hungry and I used to just immediately get up and get myself what a Snickers candy bar or whatever. And I'm just, oh yeah, wanting Snickers candy bar. This is what wanting feels like. I don't want to pursue it. So check also in your practice when you notice the wanting, but just the awareness enough allows for something else to come in that we often refer to as wisdom. But no, it's not too bad. And there's a release, a letting go. And my, my dear mentor and teacher, Joseph Goldstein, he was once uh, with his teacher, Upandita, in America, with an Amer English-speaking audience. And his teacher from Burma spoke Burmese. And he was being translated. And all of a sudden, the translator said, lust cracks the brain. I love that expression. Because that is exactly what kind of happened when we are obsessed. Lust cracks the brain. But the more we become intimate with this lust and keep seeing it over and over again and see its constant changing nature and also become more aware of its absence, the less inclined we are to crave. We see that the craving becomes painful. 
But we also start to see that then when we not pursue it and allow it to simply be an energy, an habitual energy in our body mind system, that when it subsides, the mind again becomes like sky, or mind like still water. And that's the third noble truth, the freedom that comes from not craving. Being in the midst of life without that craving energy. I once had a deep insight also that, that, that pleasure is not desire. We get tricked into thinking or feeling that the desiring is pleasurable too, but it isn't. And it's not to say that the Buddha didn't mention joy and pleasure in his teaching. It's a key element in the practice. If you wouldn't have any joy in meditation, I don't think we would still do it. But there's a lot of joy that comes from letting go, from letting be. I just want to close with one teaching that the Buddha often shared that conditions the letting go. What feeds letting go? And he said this once to the monks. He said, whatever practitioners one frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of your mind. If one frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of letting go or renunciation, one has abandoned the thought of desire. And then one's mind inclines the thoughts of letting go, of renunciation. And so here comes that reflection that we started with the talk, that when we recollect things that we've done out of generosity, by listening, giving resources, whatever we do to offer, then later on reflect on it. It can be such a source of joy, non-craving, non-desire of letting go. Another thing that feeds letting go for me is meditation where I really try to just, for example, listen. And just listen to sounds. And maybe notice that my mind starts to make meaning of the sounds, like oh, traffic outside in New York, Bart's voice. And I really go back to the bare tending of listening. Or when it's windy outside, Marnie was telling it's windy where she's at. Just feeling the wind blowing on your exposed skin. Every time that we really become close to the moment-to-moment -moment felt sense of experience, there is nothing to want, nothing to hold on to. So the Buddha had this pithy teaching where he said, let there be in the hearing, simply the hearing. And he did that for all senses, including the mind. Let there be in the thinking, simply the thinking. So that even when we're full of thoughts, if we just notice them like sounds, no problem. And often that letting go will happen just because we let things be. Body like mountain, breath like wind, mind like sky. So I'm aware of the time and Marnie had asked to leave some time for reflections. I would love to hear from you. What feeds your craving? What is a nutriment that you have? Maybe it's very helpful to share it out loud or in the chat. I can read it. Or what feeds letting go for you?
might also be a very helpful reflection to share in community. So I um, just want to thank you for your listening. I'd love to hear some of your reflections, what feeds your craving or feeds letting go for you. Feel invited to share. Let's see. So we have already two comments. Let's start with the last one from Mia. Thanks, Mia. Just one word, procrastination. Oh, I would love for people to just raise their hands or do thumbs up who have that experience too. I have you in gallery mode. I don't know if you see it, all the people, but there's so many hands up and and uh, you know what's so interesting about craving? It and I only highlighted the the part where we want something, but the energy of that wanting is also almost exactly the same when we don't want something, aversion. When we push away. And to catch that is, I think, helpful with procrastination. It's just like things are coming towards us, and there is a not wanting to do them in that moment. So, again, from a practice perspective, see if you can recognize that me and everybody else who raised their hand. And maybe again, notice. What else is present? Maybe there's tiredness. Or maybe you actually need to not do it in that moment. Maybe there's doubt that you can do it. The task at hand. Maybe you're believing like, oh, I don't have enough energy. Do you really not have enough energy? Or are you just kind of moving towards a sense of sluggishness because you don't want to do it? Just explore what else is here. You don't have to figure out why am I procrastinating. What else is here? So you bring a sense of interest into your practice. And daily life is practice too. Danielle says, chronic pain feeds my craving and to distract myself from it. I think an important point that you're bringing up, Danielle, is the Buddha also talked about skillfully redirecting your mind when the experience is too intense. Skillfully redirecting your mind when the experience is too intense. And I think it's very helpful to check, Danielle, what is your motivation? Maybe it's really coming from this place of, no, I can't handle this right now. And out of compassion, you turn to something else. I think that's actually skillful. But if you're noticing it comes from aversion, it might be very helpful to notice that and to explore that in a little bit more depth. And also explore moments when you can hold the chronic pain without aversion in a more kind of allowing way. So really just checking, how am I holding this right now? And why is this move? Diane shares, quiet and serenity as I think what leads to letting go. Just pause with that for a moment. See if that is helpful for you to hear too. Quiet and serenity. I'm also turning my eyes to the screen and see that, Jane, you have your hand up. Would you like to um, share your reflection? I first want to say someone had their hand up before me. So can you look again and see and let them in first? Mm. 
if I can, I would. Okay. So yes. Marge, I don't use, there's no other hands up. Okay, maybe they did it by mistake. All right, no problem. I will lower my hand now. Mm -hmm. Um love love your talk. And uh I wanted to share uh you asked a question regarding what works for you or what has helped. Yeah. And um I'm a psychotherapist, so that definitely um I practice what I preach, I guess I'd say. Mm -hmm. But the the gift of meditation for me, when I started when I was very young, which is fabulous has kept me alive. And I mean that seriously. Um, I have a Facebook network on my family in my age. And I've been meditating. And what it did, what happened for me, and other things happened for everybody else, uh, was this kind of um, acceptance of once a month, I'm going to get this treatment. It makes me feel... It makes me quite ill, <laughs> but it's a known. And I don't have to control it. I can let it go. And what I mean by that is really embrace it after hearing for so many years as a person in growing up in a family where productivity was the top thing, <laughs> you know, right. being academic and being productive. And I have to say that the meditation that I was doing at that time and now has stopped that need and so I don't know if it's a craving or a desire or a distraction or whatever you want to call it I am so proud of my body and my heart and soul to be able to let go of needing to control something I have no control over and being able to go with the flow yeah. And if I need to sleep, I sleep. If I need to watch it, if I want to watch a movie, I watch a movie. So I think behind all of this is there's nothing to worry about. Right. Instead, what I find myself putting doing is putting positive energy out there that this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And just really embracing compassion for myself and for the world. And to hope that that comes back to me. So you're smiling. <laughs> Happy for you, Jane. And you know, the word that keeps coming to my mind as I'm listening to you is allowing. Yeah. And that is one of my favorite instructions to myself. Also, when I'm in the funk of wanting or aversion. Or someone shared, Mel shared, loneliness is what can feed craving. Is that sense of allowing for it to be mm -hmm. and uh for some reason that keep kind of kept coming up as you were sharing jane and i'm just really appreciative and uh, and not giving and not giving that power yeah not giving over that power of i'm lonely well pick up the phone or you know right. what you know that we we are so incredibly capable of letting go of all these things we think we get attached to that we really don't. No. So that's my words of wisdom. But thank you. Thank you. And you know, the last thing I'll share, and then there's other comments that I'd love to share with you. So James, you know, that smile you had on your face, Jane, when he said, when there's that letting go, where is not pursuing it. That's in the, that's that second part of that teaching. Is it present or absence? So really noticing the absence of craving because it's so freeing, calming, relaxing. Liberating. <laughs> Liberating. This one is, I think, uh, it says song alive. I'm assuming that it's, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I just wasn't sure. Um, the notion, everything in moderation gives me license to keep going for just a little bit of that desire. This somehow gives me permission to keep wanting it, and it feeds my energy of wanting, in moderation being my delusion. Yeah. Just a little bit. 
Thank you for bringing that in. So other reflections, Diane also said aversion can lead. Oh yes, aversion leading to craving. Nathan is sharing aversion to loneliness and boredom. Let me just pause with that for a moment too. Especially also boredom, which is so can be so frequent in meditation. What if we could get really interested in boredom? I once uh, was teaching a, in a juvenile detention center meditation. And I was having the assumption that, a, that boredom would always have a sense of negativity. But there were two boys in that room. I remember saying, I like being bored. I go, really? I say, yeah, when you're bored, you don't have any responsibilities. No one is kind of telling you what to do. <laughs> kind of unlocked a whole new thing about boredom that I never noticed. Because I think their boredom, they're kind of not really needing to do anything and not be productive at all, was free from the craving that Jane was also talking about, that sense of having to be overproductive or very productive. Lynn is sharing, feeling craving for fullness. And then when achieved, it feels uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. I see so many nodding faces. Again, if you want to use a gallery view, then you can kind of see so many nodding faces. Melanie writes, stress and disputes, arguments. Yeah. And Kathleen writes, I notice in the meditation, oh wait, when you asked us to become aware of wanting, that my body was holding just the slightest bit of tension. And then when I released it, the joy of surrender. And I'm really grateful that you're sharing this with us, Kathleen, because when we talk about inside meditation, most of these insights are not really cognitive or intellectual, but they're felt with the whole system. Very often also with the sense of the visceral release. And I think you really described that so beautifully. That, And for me, it's, it's often, especially also when I do online um, you know, sessions and I'm listening to the teacher, I'm leaning forward sometimes just a little bit to the screen. And then I go back and I just noticed that difference, that my body was holding on just to the slightest bit of tension when maybe their sound's not that great or trying to get more of what they're saying. Well, thank you for that, Kathleen, and also for that release. And then I might say it not cor correctly, Marina saying, studying and getting information constant, never-ending development, becoming a better and better person, communication, making myself visible to other people to get an approval. Yeah. I'll be honest, most of my Dharma books, <laughs> I bought them at the Strand Bookstore in New York because I wanted more. <laughs> and I haven't read maybe only like maybe I haven't read maybe 80%. But the last one you're saying, I think is really helpful too, is to see what the Buddha called craving for becoming. So we're talking mostly about craving for pleasure. The Buddha also talked about craving for becoming, and it might sound like a strange word in English, but it means also craving to be someone or to be seen in a certain way or to get an approval in a certain way. There, too, this energy is really strong, connected to how we want other people to see us or hear us. Thank you for sharing that.
Leslie saying, don't just don't just do something. Just, wait, don't just do something. Just sit there. <laughs> yeah. Keep sitting there. But even that we can be kind of um, judgmental to ourselves in our practice. Especially when I don't meditate. And when you kind of had an intention to practice that day and you don't. What I found so helpful is once I shared that with my teacher and he just said, maybe just bowing to your Buddha Bart that day is enough practice. Okay. I needed to hear that. And this is from Sandra. If I could get really interested in boredom, what what would so much help? That would so much help with work. <laughs> yeah. And then Jane writes, being authentic. I think that really allows for letting go too. And mindfulness is kind of just like this mirror. It simply knows and reflects what's going on. It's always real with us. And one of the things I'm sharing in our reflection as a community right now is also your honesty, your humanity, you being authentic. Then um, Ivita writes, craving for specialness. Oh yeah. that ad that was running on that feed for me for the guitar. It was special. I'm chosen to get a free, usually $900 guitar. But also this, sometimes there's this hunger to be seen as a special person or a compassionate father for me or a diligent meditator. It's the same craving. Young Chen writes, yesterday I craved something unhealthy and I sat with it for a while. I had that moment of wisdom and then I ignored the wisdom and ate the junk food anyway. What's up with that? <laughs> oh, yes. I'm so glad you brought that in. Have you ever been in a pool with a plastic soccer ball and you want to push it down under the water? You know, it kind of takes a lot of effort. And as soon as someone might call your attention and you're not pushing gently anymore, boom, it comes back out. That's exactly how that feels for me. Uh, and again, thanks for being so real. And also that that's okay. But really also to see already that budding of some wisdom inclining to us, this is not helpful. What would happen if that pattern that you described, that Yang Chen, keeps repeating again and again, but you're bringing frequent, careful attention to it? Remember what the Buddha said? That the food for craving is the sign of the beautiful, frequently getting careless attention to it? What might happen if Keep doing it over and over again, but with a sense of interest when it comes again. You're doing another episode on Netflix. You know you got potato chips, but you're full. You don't really need the potato chips. You already had an ice cream. And just notice what happens. And, uh, and to be okay when you end up just eating the potato chips. Hmm. I'm aware of the time and I wanna honor your time. I know there's more questions also for me and I might've skipped a few. Um, if it's okay, I wanna to come to a close, if that's all right. Um, what's also been shared I'm seeing right now is um, my personal website. Um, 
I want to thank you, Marnie, for holding the space so beautifully. And um, also, if you ever want to come to our online Sangha, which is also on Sundays, but way earlier, you're most welcome to come to cmcnewyork.org and join us there. And um, but maybe pause and see if you can recollect a generous deed you've done today. It could be showing up here at Sangha Live. It could be that you've listened, shared food, resources. And the mind is recollecting generosity. It's not overcome by greed, hatred, or confusion. The mind heads straight. Body like mountain. Breath like wind, mind like clear water, mind like sky. May our practice today be a cause and condition for inner and outer peace. May there be peace. May there be peace. May all beings be liberated. If you don't mind, I'll ring a bell and then we can maybe unmute and holler and wave. Let me get that bell first. Here we go. <laughs> All are yelling there. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, so much. Thank you. Peace and gratitude. Did I show Stay you? Well. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Bart. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you. Peace wow. and gratitude. Hey, Bart. Too soon. Thanks, Michael. Uh, look at when people talk. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take good care. Thanks for all your comments. Um, yeah. This place is Buddha. What's that? Yeah. I couldn't hear you saying Pierre. Oh, I said I was admiring your Buddha and your environment. Oh my this is my bedroom in Harlem. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you. Ah. Well, Marnie, so appreciate everything you've done for us today. And, uh, I so appreciate your teaching today. Very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you.